Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the ninth edition of the Coffee Microcaps uh, morning meeting. I just want to go through a, quickly through a few housekeeping slides and then we'll be straight on to our first presenter this morning. It's a disclaimer for anybody who wants to read that. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. Uh, for anybody who hasn't uh, joined us before, you're very welcome to this edition. Uh, the structure of the webinar for anybody who hasn't um, attended one of the previous virtual events, it's one hour. We have two companies uh, to each get 30 minutes. So we'll have a 20 minute prezzo and then uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box um, on your screen rather than in the chat function. And then I'll try and pose as many questions as possible to the presenters at the end of their presentation. Um, if you miss any of the slides, if they click through too quickly um, or you want to see uh, companies that have, might have previously presented, this webinar will be recorded and it will go up on our YouTube channel probably by about Saturday. Uh, I'll announce on Twitter once it's up there uh, and feel free to, to, to revise over it if you need to. Um, or you can find out more about Coffee Microcaps. Uh, Twitter is probably the best place. As I said, YouTube for all recordings of this webinar and previous ones. LinkedIn, we do some additional long form content and we also run a subscription newsletter via this Substack uh, subscription platform. Uh, our two presenters today, first up, we've got uh, Miss Kate Quirk from uh, Alcidian Group. I'd like to thank Kate. This is actually her second time presenting. Uh, she presented at one of our in-person events when those were still a thing pre-COVID. So I'd like to welcome her back. And then straight after Kate, we're going to have Mr. Neil Joseph from Australian Primary Hemp. Okay, that's the housekeeping out of the way. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and uh, Kate is going to start sharing hers. You good to see that, Mark? Uh, yeah, I can see your cover slide now, Kate. Perfect, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for your time today and thanks for the opportunity, Mark. It's great to come back again um, to present. I know that um, I've probably got a mixed audience today. Uh, so I thought I'd just take a minute or two to run a video giving you some background as to what Alcidian does. Technology is opening up new possibilities for prevention, care and treatment in all aspects of healthcare. But healthcare organisations can face a myriad of challenges when implementing innovation. IT systems across hospitals, GP practices and nursing homes don't talk to each other. Patient information flows between wards and operations are disjointed and multiple isolated health records have increased the cognitive load on clinicians, shifting the focus away from patient care. That's where Alcidian takes control, helping healthcare organisations harness the power of technology to create a clinically relevant environment with digitally enabled care. Alcidian's platform combines technologies like artificial intelligence and clinical decision support with real-time visualization tools, helping clinicians interpret critical information to make informed decisions at every level. We want to make the right thing to do the easiest thing to do. Mobile technology replaces paper charts traditionally used to capture the bedside observations. Physicists can use devices like iPads to digitally record their patients' vital signs, which means doctors always have access to current patient status whenever needed and wherever they are. Patient data is instantly available in real time to all clinicians responsible for care, anytime, anywhere. It provides automated, tailored alerts about patients at risk, as well as actionable insights aligned with practice guidelines. By bringing together sources of data from various systems such as laboratory and radiology and applying intelligent clinical decision support, Alcidian draws attention to the information clinicians need to act on immediately, supporting timely intervention, improving care and engineering safety into healthcare. Alcidian's platform gives healthcare organisations an enterprise-wide view of their patients and facilities 
to optimise patient flow and assist in efficient management, enabling resources to be freed up. Alcidian partners with healthcare organisations to modernise existing IT systems, while leveraging new healthcare IT investments to enhance clinical workflows and patient outcomes. Our challenge to our customers is, what do you want to engineer out of the healthcare system? What problems do you want to remove? Smarter Health Informatics for a safer delivery of care. Request your demo today. So putting it simply, we offer a unique platform that's effectively a smart infrastructure for healthcare. Um, our current territories that we work in, uh, where we've installed customers, are the United Kingdom, New Zealand and Australia. We're an, an Australian listed company that was listed back in 2016 as a, re a result of an RTO. And at that point in time, we were really a smart engineering IT company based out of Adelaide with around 26 staff, very focused on um, exactly what we said, engineering problems out of healthcare using data. Um, a couple of years ago, we acquired two larger healthcare IT businesses, one which was a large service delivery and product company based in Sydney, and another one uh, based in the UK that had a software product called Patient Track, which was really strategically aligned to our product offering. And we completed those acquisitions a couple of years ago. And, and since then, we've integrated those businesses and demonstrated the cross-selling opportunities that it has existed with bringing out the product set together. And we've now grown the revenues and have over 115 staff across Australia, New Zealand and the UK. And that, that has allowed us to position Alcidian as an innovative healthcare IT provider with the opportunity to act as a disruptor in healthcare and a disruptor obviously in a, in a positive way. Our platform draws on the investment that's been made already in the last five to 10 years to digitalize healthcare data. So where we had data in a paper format um, obviously, in the last five to 10 years, we've seen people invest in radiology and laboratory systems and pharmacy systems. And what our platform does is layer across the top of that, our Maya Precision platform there in the mauve colour, uh, and it allows us to draw that data and aggregate it into a single platform from which we can drive a whole range of activities. And, and um, Alcidian today provides capabilities across all of the um, blue boxes above the purple um, platform line, as well as the platform. And that allows our, our customers to, to, to take, um, to come on a journey with us in terms of, uh, of purchasing capabilities, uh, but also to provide um, the only platform today that really allows you to bring together algorithms and support artificial intelligence from all of the data that exists in healthcare today. Uh, one of our, um, you know, really, uh, you know, keen focuses is how do we actually support patient safety and better out, out healthcare outcomes. And some of you may not know that healthcare has often had a lot of challenges around patient safety. We know um, that adverse events happen during the delivery of healthcare, and they happen often, unfortunately. I know the third biggest killer of US citizens after cardiac arrest and cancer is actually adverse events in healthcare, which is basically mistakes that happen during the delivery of healthcare. Here in Australia, one in four overnight stays will result in an adverse event, which can cost more than a billion dollars, half a billion dollars a year. So we wanna use our technology platform to engineer safety into healthcare. And as a result of that, we'll get better patient outcomes. And, and, and following on from that is we'll get better uh, improved efficiency in running of healthcare and a happier healthcare workforce, which is a really big focus uh, um, of the healthcare industry at the moment. So now I've sort of brought you all up to date onto the, to the same page about understanding what our Alcidian does. I thought I'd give you an update um, on our FY20 results. Obviously, that's where we are in terms of the, um, the reporting season um, just coming to a conclusion. We're really pleased with the progress we made over the past year in what has been, you know, one of the most challenging of business environments. Alcidian has continued to grow our revenue, delivering a full year revenue of 18.6 million, which was up 10% on the prior year. Most notably though, the recurring revenue base increased by 35% on the prior year to 10 and a half million. As we continued to transition the company post the acquisition of those two companies I talked about before, MKM Health and Patient Track, we've really had a strong focus on increasing the revenue base from, from product sales particularly, and that's been a key objective of ours. 
So it's really pleasing to see the growth in our recurring revenue base. This is the result of a deliberate strategy that we've had in play, which was to move the customers to a subscription recurring payment licensing model. Not always the first choice from a healthcare sector perspective. They often like to, to buy licenses up front and pay a lesser ongoing recurring revenue. So we're seeing a shift in the healthcare industry. It's not, um, it's, it's still a work in progress, but we're certainly seeing that shift. And what that does is reflect uh, the healthy forward sold revenue that we've got. So as we increase our recurring revenue, we have more revenue booked out into future years. And the, the, the revenue sold revenue numbers out to nearly 30 million to FY25. Then the growth of that revenue was achieved despite challenges arising, obviously from the current pandemic that we're in, in particularly that impacted the second half, which it has seen people in healthcare who uh, normally might be working on our projects or focused on procurement, needing to be refocused and managing what was happening from the pandemic perspective. I won't go into too much detail about um, COVID-19 and the impact it has on business, because I'm sure you've all heard it from many companies. But from us, in some cases, it's, going, it's having a positive effect, certainly in the mid to long term. And in the short term, those challenges that arose for the healthcare perspective meant that a lot of our um, customers were really focused on the short term needs of having to um, treat patients, manage a surge um, capacity and, and, and so forth. So there, whilst there was a short term immediate impact, it impacted Q4 sales and a little bit of Q1, FY21. However, we've seen this sorted out now and opportunities are emerging even more stronger that, uh, and some of the opportunities during the pandemic have allowed us to really focus on developing our out of hospital care capabilities from the platform. This had always been on our roadmap, but we have brought this forward uh, to meet the needs of, of, of what has been happening in respect of the, the pandemic. And that resulted in two short, two contracts in New South Wales which was to immediately focus on supporting the, the healthcare sector to treat patients in the pandemic. Overall, the COVID-19 um, pandemic has shone uh, a light on the need for information technology across all sectors. We're all become much more um, tech savvy during this time, but it's really heightened in healthcare where we've had both a need to treat patients, but also to keep workers safe from an infection control perspective. And where we previously had an underinvestment in healthcare IT, we're really seeing governments around the world looking to continue the move to digitalization that's emerged through this time. And there's no desire for anyone to return to the old ways. So for Alcidian, the pandemic will in fact create greater opportunity, medium to long-term. But as I said, in the short term, it did have some impact on that revenue growth. Whereas in the previous year, we'd had a revenue growth closer to 25 to 30%. During the year, we also took significant steps to ready our organisation for the anticipated growth in FY21 and beyond. We established important reference sites in our key three markets, which is very important in healthcare. We also bolstered our sales and marketing capabilities, doubling the size of the sales team, adding to the, the, the systems and the capabilities in the business to support the scale of the business as we grow and plan to grow in the next couple of years. And we evolved the product suite, particularly in that area of supporting workers in a mobile environment and working, um, looking after patients who are, who are ill, potentially in being looked after in their own home. So as we see, and we complete this investment phase in FY21, we'd expect to see revenue growth accelerate and the cost pace stabilise. Just to unpack that in a little bit more detail, as I mentioned earlier, we had a 10% increase on revenue, um, this with the second, second half being impacted, but we also had some challenges in the first half from the UK, and the UK is a really significant market for us. The opportunity is, uh, is a large one, and but we, we, what we had happening in the first half of the year was the government elections were called unexpectedly. We had Brexit and so forth. And it took really four or five months for that to, to, to settle down and work its way through the system. So despite, you know, our, our largest opportunity, having some of those challenges in the first half and then the second half with COVID, we're really pleased with where we've, we've ended up. So and most importantly, that 35% that increase in recurring revenue that was delivered this year. We enter 2021 with a strong position. So with 12.8 million at the beginning of the year already contracted to be delivered in this financial year, that's before we sell anything further. 
subject, of course, to, to milestone achievement, but also a really healthy sales pipeline. And I expect that to continue to grow as the new sales team uh, are fully engaged and are back now out meeting with customers rather than needing to do everything virtually. Our business also has a solid cash balance of nearly 16 million as at the 30th of June, which positions us well to continue to execute on those plans for growth. At the beginning of the last uh, financial year of FY20, we, we set out a growth strategy to the market, positioning how Alcidian was planning to capitalise on this increasing market opportunity we have globally for in healthcare. And given the enormous potential we had, we, we felt it was really important that um, we had the capacity to actually do what we needed to do to, to, to go after that opportunity, which was to scale up our sales and marketing capability, our product implementation capabilities and add to the product development. So we raised 16.2 million in November, 2019, which seems like a, an awful, awful long time ago, but isn't even a year ago now. And that funding was to provide us both the scale, um, to scale the existing business, but also to investigate any other potential acquisitions that might be aligned to our strategy. We've already proven that we can do acquisitions well. Uh, we need to ensure that when we are looking for acquisitions that they're strategically aligned and that they're gonna add to the overall proposition of the business. Uh, but that is still a uh, continued part of our strategy, obviously being a little bit hampered by, by the COVID situation. Uh, so we, we made a number of investments in FY20 to support the future growth bro profile. And I'll touch on those a little bit as we move um, through the slide deck. Over the past year, we've signed several strategically significant contracts in each of our markets, and we've increased our customer base with now 307 hospitals across UK, Australia, and New Zealand using New Zealand using an Alcidian product. And it is really critical to have reference sites in healthcare. It's an evidence-based industry and they like to look at uh, people, uh, they like to see solutions like ours successfully implemented and, and they tend to look at really um, early adopters of technology as the place where evidence, um, they, where they look for evidence. So during the year, we extended our relationship with Dartford and Gravesham Trust in the UK, adding um, our electronic uh, prescribing module from one of our partners. And so we, are, we now have a full Alcidian suite deployed there in the UK as a reference site. In the Australian market, I'm really proud of the work we've done at, um, with our Maya Precision platform at Wagga Wagga Base Hospital. We, uh, we were engaged there as part of an innovation proof of concept under New South Wales Health's direction. And it was here that our mobile solution that runs off Maya Precision, which we call Maya Memory, went live for the first time. And it's received huge praise um, from the doctors there in terms of its ability to deliver uh, meaningful information, um, alerts and notifications, identifying patients at risk or patients that need attention right to the doctor's phones. And so Murrumbidgee has signed an initial 12 month, month contract to roll that out. But Whilst we were doing that, uh, we've also implemented a COVID monitoring dashboard and expanded the rollout of memory to support the pandemic. And I'm going to give you a quick rundown of how that works um, in a minute. Building on that work that was done in, in um, New South Wales for, the, for that, we also have signed a contract with Sydney LHD, which is the largest, one of the largest metropolitan health districts in New South Wales to roll out our COVID monitoring um, virtual care platform as well. So between both of those LHDs, we've got a rural uh, and a metropolitan. It allows us to demonstrate and position our technology uh, to the wider New South Wales um, uh, market as well. We also restructured the UK business during the year so that and, and doubled the sales capacity there because we believe the opportunity in the UK is so significant. So we'll continue to um, evolve our platform and in the pl platform that we've built to support COVID is actually got huge um, uh, applicability beyond what we're doing for the pandemic. And we see that, you know, managing, managing patients with diabetes and chronic conditions over, over time will also be able to be managed in this type of manner. And if I just give you kind of a, it's sometimes good to have an opportunity to see what the solution looks like. I haven't got a huge amount of time, but just to show you that this across the top here is what we call a dashboard. This comes from our My platform. Anyone that's seen any of the solution before will be familiar with this kind of setup. So we've got the doctors and nurses at Wagga Wagga Base Hospital and soon to be um, RPA 
being able to sit a, you know, and look at all of their patients in a list here and information that is critical about that patient. But what we've done at Wagga is the Wagga Wagga uh, base hospital has given patients these armbands that are taking their vital signs and, and from a COVID perspective, temperature and oxygen saturations and pulse are really critical vital signs. So we can look at this and see that you know, 20 minutes ago, information was provided for Mervyn Jones, and we can see it's amber. So there's some risk around this patient and we want the doctors and nurses to probably make contact with this patient. And then we're deploying here in, when you see at the phone, an app for the patient who's capturing information about their actual uh, current conditions. So their, their, um, their symptoms and how they're feeling, what medications they've taken. And also if they need to, they can make contact with the nurse who's sitting back at the hospital. And that is something that is actually running today um, in, uh, at Wagga Wagga. And some of the stories that are coming out of there are absolutely fantastic. And we're feeling very um, positive about how that will play out. Just to give you a quick update about the, the opportunity and, and the size of it. I've talked really at the moment just about UK, Australia and New Zealand, and that's where we're focused. We're certainly looking at what new other geographies we might extend into. But from the UK perspective, it's a very large um, opportunity in terms of the total number of beds in the UK. We already have some of our um, patient tracks uh, and, and, and my precision deployed there, but it's around about a 1.1 billion opportunity just in terms of the size. We have, it's a really um, excellent market in terms of their maturity and their ability to take on um, new solutions and also their preparedness and investment from the government perspective in wanting to modernise the National Health Service. In terms of the Australian market, which is obviously a smaller market than the UK, although still sizable in 450 million, we, we have a, a presence in this market with some of our underlying products and capabilities, but the opportunity for my precision is, is significant. Um, and, and obviously it is our home state. And then the other market that we operate in is New Zealand which is a smaller market, but we have a strong penetration in this market with patient track. Um, and uh, that is in, you know, probably 45, 50% of the beds in New Zealand. We also have my precision in the first site in New Zealand, which uh, was deployed at mid central district health board board across all of those three um, territories. We're seeing real um, focus from the government in terms of the need to invest more in digital health. There was a recent all of healthcare sector review in New Zealand, for example, that signaled a need for further investment in digital health to support data driven decision making, which is what we are all about. Um, in terms of what we've been doing and where we're going, as I said, at the beginning of last financial year, we set out our growth strategy, positioning us to capitalize on the market opportunity. Our products are exceptionally well participated to, to not only participate, but drive this revolutionary change in, in, in healthcare. We offer the, some of the only solutions that combine AI and clinical decision support with the ability to bring in those observations that I just talked about. We raised capital to support that growth opportunity and we're well down the track in executing on that strategy. Um, and as I said earlier, we've restructured the business, doubled our sales and marketing capability. We're looking at geographical expansion and how we continue to reach more people with our capabilities without necessarily always increasing the cost base. So where to from here? Um, what's next for us? Well, truthfully, we enter 21, obviously well capitalized and poised for growth. While we're already seeing many positive initial impacts from the investments we've made, substantial revenue growth obviously takes time. Um, post the investment in, in sales resources and, and we will see that play out over FY21 and FY22. Whilst we've not been immune from the impact of COVID, we enter this financial year confidently primed for further growth with um, you know, 12.8 million already um, locked away for this year and, and, and a further 30 million um, committed out to the 2025. Now, truthfully, the healthcare crisis has shone a light on the readiness and preparedness of healthcare to, to respond. I mean, they've done an amazing job and technology has definitely been a part of the response. And the truth is no one wants to take a step back from that. And I, and I think what we're experiencing now will no doubt um, assist the acceleration and adoption of IT in health. 
So thank you very much. A lot of information to try and get across quickly, um, but very happy to obviously answer your questions. Uh, thanks, Kate. I've actually got uh, two questions um, and I've got one or two myself. We have time. Um, there's a lot of competitors um, in this space. Um, one of the questions is what competitive advantages has El City and I guess Maya compared to, you know, the big US guys like Cerner? Yeah. So firstly, we don't compete with Cerner. We actually add value to the Cerner solution. So at Murrumbidgee, Sydney LHD, we're actually taking real time data out of the EMR. Uh, what people see, what we're doing is drawing on all that data that, um, you know, it's fantastic that we've actually got that infrastructure in in Australia and a number of sites around having all of that data in a digital format, but it's not designed in a way that actually supports doctors and nurses workflows or their decision making. So we sit on top of uh, solutions like Cerner, like Epic, like the big um, US guys, and we take that data and we call ourselves a system of engagement. So we help to use that data to support decision making. Um, so we are definitely working as a value add, not as an alternative. Of course, in the UK and some sites that don't want to go down that path of investing in a great big, you know, EMR that takes many, many years to, to even just to get to the point where you've got all digitalization. We see people like Dartford and Gravesham who, who choose our platform combined with patient track and our partners medication management solution as an alternative to an EMR and you know, in that case, those sites aren't even interested or entertaining the big US guys. So um, there, there are different ways to, to approach the market. I, I see we've got quite a unique proposition because we can coexist in either of those um, environments or digital environments. Um, then another question, Kate, um, I guess what's your biggest worry in this industry? Is it, you know, Cybersecurity, uh, acquisition they've put down as a worry. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a worry or, you know, maybe I guess somebody, somebody I guess, snapping you up before I, I guess El Cidian can realize its full potential. Yes, um, what good, goodness. I, I don't worry about um, acquisition. Um, obviously we're building something and we don't need that, uh, you know, that is not part of our strategy to be, to be acquired. It's actually to deliver on the huge opportunity ahead of us. Um, obviously we always keep an eye on cybersecurity. We will be continuing, we will be putting further investment in the first half of FY21 to make sure that that part of our business is, you know, absolutely as bulletproof as it can be. So that's something I think everyone has an eye on. Um, I think the biggest issue at the moment for me is making sure that, um, you know, we don't lose the opportunity that the pandemic has given us and that, um, that, that health continues to invest in, in this area. I, I'm seeing that there is no turning back from investments in telehealth and, and digital health and so forth. But, you know, obviously it's an uncertain time in terms of the pandemic. So I suppose like everybody, I, I, I would love some more certainty in our lives. Yeah. And then two other quick ones, Kate. Um, as the reference sites building, are you finding the sales cycle shortening? Or is it still? You know, yeah, look, I mean, sales cycle are, are, are definitely, um, uh, you know, protracted in the sense of, uh, you know, it's a very complex sale. They're very large sales. So if anyone's going to spend six, seven, eight million dollars with you for a three to five year contract, they're obviously wanting to take their, their go through their processes. But we are certainly seeing that once you've got that first evidence base, then it's much quicker to move them through the process of choosing you because they can go and talk to other customers. In the UK, we get, um, they, they have a, a way of shortening procurement by getting on frameworks. And if you get on a framework contract, that means you've kind of done nine tenths of the procurement and really then the customer is able to buy from that framework. So there's, I'm seeing lots of changes in healthcare about trying to reduce the length of time it takes to get these innovative project, uh, projects out there. And then one last one, I might forward you some of these, um, Kate, uh, after your presentation. Is there, have you got any data in terms of doctors, nurses, user kind of satisfaction? Is there like a, a net promoter score for Maya Precision or the Alcidian framework? Look, I mean, great question. You know, we, I have to say the, the best evidence we've got is the anecdotal evidence that there has been a report produced out of the Wagga Wagga Innovation Challenge, which uh, 
New South Wales hasn't really, I think there's just a whole lot going on at the moment in terms of pandemic and their focus isn't on that. But, you know, we actually were part of that. The response from the doctors and nurses in Wagga has been, you know, quite amazing. They loved the use of it. They didn't want to give it up. It was supposed to be a proof of concept. There was no way they were giving those iPhones back and the access to that information back. So, you know, from that perspective, it's been very positive. We have just introduced net promoter scores across our business for our support teams. Um, and we are looking to do a more formalised um, benefits realisation review uh, out, out of the work we're doing in Wagga and, and Sydney. So um, I think there's more information to come on that. But uh, anecdotally, and there's a case study, if anyone's interested, on our website of Murrumbidgee Local Health District. And it is really very insightful and it has a lot of comments from the doctors and users there. Okay. Kit, I'm going to have to let you go because I do know you have have something else to join and I want to get our next presenter uh, up and running. So thank you very much for your time. Sorry if I haven't got to everybody's questions, but we were just a, a bit overloaded with questions there. Um, yeah, if you want me to, if there's some way that I can answer for them in some other way, I'm very happy to do that. But yeah. otherwise, thanks very much for your time this morning. Yeah, I'll share them with you, Kit. Thank you. Okay. Just stop sharing your screen, Kate, and I'll share mine again. Okay, for uh, our next presentation, we've got Mr. Neil Joseph from Australian Primary Hemp. Neil, uh, are you with us? I believe you are. Good morning. Good morning, yes, Mark. Can you hear me? We can. Um, just gonna get your there we go so i'm gonna help neil through his um presentation slide deck um but uh, neil will be doing all the talking i'll simply be the remote control <laughs> very very nice thank you very much um mark for inviting me onto the onto the presentation and good morning everybody this is the first presentation of this type that we've done as a company so really really pleased to be able to tell you a little bit about australian primary hemp and really it is it's an introduction to the market um, the company was founded in 2016 to develop uh, alternative alternative plant proteins the, the founders of the business are both farmers coming from a long farming history and as a result they'd seen the inefficiencies in 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 animal based protein and were looking for for some alternatives so australian primary hemp in summary is a fully integrated paddock to plate hemp uh, producer, manufacturer, and marketer. Um, and, and as I said, we're focused on, on plant-based protein. If we can flick to the next slide, please, Mark. Uh, yeah, probably actually the one, the one after that, because I think the critical question really is, is why hemp? And why do we focus on hemp? And we focused on hemp for a number of reasons. And this is, I guess, uh, core to, to our business moving forward. Firstly, it's a sustainable crop. It requires minimal to no pesticides. It uses half to two thirds less water than cotton and other cereal crops. It absorbs, it's a carbon sink, so it absorbs carbon dioxide and it regenerates the soil. So because it's a rotational crop, what we've actually seen is, is it's a short, it's a short um, harvest cycle of only 14 weeks. And, um, and often the farmers that then plant their, their following crop into that field where hemp has just been, see a very significant uplift also in their crops, which shows the regenerative nature of, uh, of hemp into the soil. Um, the second reason we focus on hemp is because it's, it's an incredible plant-based protein, which is a great substitute to traditional proteins. It has the perfect blend of omega-3, 6 and 9 proteins. It's packed with linoleic acids, which are fantastic um, for the body, and has zero fat. And so it's a really great alternative protein and it's evolving in its use as we move forward. The third, the third thing that made hemp so attractive is that it's actually got so many uses. So depending on which piece of research you look at, um, there are up to 50,000 um, very clearly defined commercial uses for hemp, um, whether it's food, medicine, building products and, and, and the like. Um, our, business, our business is focusing on, on only three of those areas, which I'll talk to in just a moment. Our business is, is built on really five key pillars. One is sustainability. So I've talked to you about that with the crop. Um, Plant-based nutrition, which I've, which I've touched on briefly. And we are seeing such a significant 
such a significant move in this space. And I guess if, if, if you want to sort of picture what I'm talking about, if you walk down the aisle of a supermarket today and, the, and you look at the snack aisle, you, in, in, in maybe as recently as five to 10 years ago, that snack aisle will have been filled with confectionery primarily. And the health food aisle, which is generally adjacent to that in a sort of bizarre twist, is, um, has generally been quite small. If you go down a, a, one of the new, the new versions of a Coles or Woolworths supermarket today, you'll see exactly the opposite now, where the health food aisle has expanded, the snack food or confectionery aisle has shrunk, and those, those health food aisles are spilled into a range of value-added health food products, many of which are plant-based. So we're seeing, we're seeing that plant-based nutrition uh, continue to grow. Traceability is critical for us, and our business model is a paddock to plate business model. And, um, and as a result, we, um, we, 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 see trace, we want traceability right from the seed all the way through to, um, to the, to the uh, product. Mark, if you could move to the next slide. Um, so as a business, we, um, so, so that just sort of covers off a little bit about what we're doing. And as a business, we're really focused on, on where we're going. So um, if you can flick to the next slide, Mark, so we're focused on really three areas. We're focused on our food business. So in that, that specifically, I mean human nutrition, animal nutrition as the second, second plank, and the third area is beauty. And I'll go into those in, in detail in just a moment. The fifth plank to our business, or pillar to our business is our products have to be Australian sown and grown. So we grow our product with fantastic group of farmers in Tasmania and the Western districts of Victoria. Our, we have a unique seed genetics called Fenola, which gives incredible um, nutritional outcomes as well as growing and harvesting outcomes for our farmers. Um, and we control the process all the way from the seed, all the way through to the customer. So completely traceable and grown here in Australia, where there's an abundance of land, an abundance of fresh air, an abundance of water, and we get very, very, very high quality product. And last but not least is um, we want to have clear channels to market. So in, in our different parts of our business, which I'll talk to in just a moment, there are very clearly defined, well-established channels to market which enable us to capture consumers and really grow very quickly. So let me take you through the three, the three areas of our business. If you can move to the next slide, Mark. Um, yeah, okay. So the three areas of our business, first is, is, the food, is the food market. So the food market, plant-based nutrition in food market um, is valued at 65 billion Australian dollars today and is projected to be at $74.2 billion by 2027, with an annual growth rate of 10.2. So we're playing in a large market, in high growth, and with very strong consumer tailwinds to play in there. Now we're gonna engage in that market, we are engaging that market in two ways. We have a food ingredients business, which was the existing business um, that, that, uh, that was with inside Australian Primary Hemp. And we're evolving very significantly into a branded value-added products business. So our food, our food ingredients business primarily supplies other manufacturers with plant-based protein, hemp seed, hemp oil, hemp flour, and hemp protein, all of which are different value-added stages from, from when the, the product is, is farmed and harvested. And then value-added products. So we are taking those products and we're turning them into value-added products. So um, uh, you'll see later on in the deck, we, ha we have developed a range of snack bars, um, consumer, consumer oil products, um, and uh, consumer protein and, and other products. And we have a very long list of new product development coming out in the value-added space. Um, so, so the reason we're doing that is because we want to capture more of the value chain. The, the food ingredients business is a high volume, medium margin business. The branded value added products is a high volume, high margin business. So we are trying to transition our business more towards, towards the value added side. And so if I look forward, say uh, 18 months to two years, I'd like to see the business mix at about 70% value added and 30% ingredients business, which will then reflect on greater revenues and higher margins for the business as we go forward. And based on the tailwinds in the market, there's really no reason 
why the market won't support that. And it's about, it's about educating consumers about hemp and delivering products which have efficacy, so they actually work, are absolutely delicious, and are on trend with the market. The second area that we're focusing on is our pet nutrition business. That's a very significant market also. It's worth, uh, it's planned to be uh, worth $113 billion by 2025 and is growing, depending on the research, between four and 7% per year. Pet ownership in Australia is the highest per capita anywhere in the world, with 61% of households own, uh, owning, owning a pet. For us, we're focusing on just two very specific areas within that pet market. One is pet nutrition for dogs, and the other is pet nutrition for horses. Why are we focusing on that? Hemp has been proven to have very demonstrable impacts in a positive way on dogs' eye health, heart health, skin health, and digestion. And dogs happen to absolutely love the taste and flavor of hemp products. So we're working, we're working in that particular market on dietary supplements, both dry and wet food supplements, which support the very significant dog food market. We have a range of, of products which we have developed and we're in the process of launching those at the moment. Um, in, the, in the horse market, which is another area where horses also benefit very significantly from the benefits from, from the properties of hemp. We're focusing on, on a very small tight range of pelletized products for, for horse feed. And again, the benefits are very significant. We're working uh, here in Australia with, um, with the, the major retailers and also have, have experiencing very strong interest from distributors um, in, in the US, UK and Europe. And, um, and that's, uh, that's work in progress at the moment, but those markets are very, very significant for us. The third area is the beauty market. The beauty market has a, and the skincare market in particular, which we're focusing on, has a total value of about $189 billion globally. And the natural organic skincare market, which is the area that we would focus on, has a value of about 55 billion and is growing at 28% year on year. Hemp has a natural SPF factor of seven, which is what a lot of, com a lot of, a lot of competitors in this market try and manufacture with, um, with, with synthetic products. Hemp has it naturally. So our plan is to leverage the power of hemp and to, to act, add that to other active ingredients to create a very strong natural skincare range, which will, which will focus on, on con consistent innovation as we go forward. Very clearly defined markets in all of these areas. In our food business, it's a B2B market to, to major ingredient manufacturers and food manufacturers and the like. Um, to our, on our value added products, it's through food service and grocery and health food. We already have uh, established distributors in every state in Australia, and we have customers, uh, we have in excess of 500 customers already, which are primarily health food stores and independent supermarkets. In the, in the um, nutri pet nutrition space, uh, again, online, which is a very important part of, of, the, uh, of the pet market, uh, as 35% of purchases are done online because often, often products come in large, in large packages and people don't want to drag those home. So home delivery is really important, um, as well as the major pet retailers and, and our own online channel, which, which continues to grow for us as a business. And for beauty, it will be a mixture of online and some of the major retailers and the pharmacy channel, all of where very well established. So that's, that's the opportunity for our business. So what have we done so far? Well, this week we're launching our new food brand named Mount Elephant. Mount Elephant, and you'll see it later on in the slides. If you can go down, if you can go down another slide, please, Mark. Um, actually, if we go down another slide to the appendices, and we'll start to show you some of the image. That's it. Go back one. So that's that's the the, the first images. So back down just down to the packaging, Mark. One more forward, I think. That's it. Thank you. Um, we are launching our Mount Elephant brand in a very clearly defined range of products. Beautiful packaging, um, really great quality products, absolutely delicious, very attractive price points for the consumer because hemp is new. So we, we, we've actually come up with some, 
smaller sizes to enable them to try it without having to, to overinvest out of their grocery basket. And, um, and we're launching those this week into the 500 grocery and health food stores. Last week or the week before, we announced a supply deal in our ingredients business with Annex Foods, which owns the Red Tractor brand and supplies products into supermarkets in Australia and to 10 countries around the world. And we see a pipeline of those other opportunities, not only there, but a pipeline of opportunities in our value added products, which we're pursuing right now. Um, so we're pursuing all of those. The fourth thing that we've done is we've rebuilt our team. So we now have a, we're only a small business. Um, we only have uh, 14 people in our entire group at the moment. And uh, we've brought in very experienced sales, and sales team and marketing team. And we're building our momentum as we go forward. So what's our plan going forward? So we've obviously got a lot of new product development for our Mount Elephant brand and for our pet food brand, um, which, we are, which we are pursuing and launching now. Our pet food brand will be launched into the market in uh, October, November of this year. So our plan is to continue with our new product development in those areas, as well as broaden our distribution, both here in Australia and with international opportunities which are presenting themselves. We, as I said, we're launching our pet nutritional brand in October, November here in Australia. And as I said, we already have interest from international distributors and we'll be entering the beauty market in early 2021. We wanna just focus on delivering the outcomes we can deliver now and then do everything in a very structured way. So in summary for us, we're a plant-based nutrition business. Hemp is an exciting and versatile protein source there are very strong tailwinds and a change of consumer sentiment towards sustainable, traceable, plant-based protein. We're evolving our business from an from a ingredients business to a branded value-added products business. We're operating in large markets, all of which are in growth. And we wanna ensure we have traceable, product, traceable products which are clean and, and have efficacy going forward. We think we, this is a very exciting space for us. And, uh, and we, we've seen other plant-based products like soy and oats really go along this way. And we see ourselves following in those footsteps. Um, and the demand uh, is, is really exciting for us in the future. That's the summary and the introduction of Australian Primary Hemp, Mark. Thanks, uh, Neil. Uh, I haven't seen any questions come through directly for you yet, but I have a, I have a few myself that I picked up just when you were going. Um, going through into in terms of the international space uh are you focused on exports both on the ingredient side and the branded side or is it just the uh, just the branded side uh, it's on both actually we have we have opportunities we have opportunities in both um because because hemp is a relatively uh, new protein there's a lot of uh process and um and certification that is required so we're, we're working through those, those opportunities very carefully, but it's on both. And not only, not only in the food side, but in the pet nutrition side as well. And then one of the things that the farmers always complain about, or the public seem to always complain about, is the price that the farmers get paid compared to the, the shelf price of products. How does, I guess you have the whole value chain, how does pricing agreements or pricing arrangements work with the, the farmers that you deal with? So, so farmers are, are very um, long-term long thinkers and successful business people and often intergenerational. So they're very commercially savvy. We have clearly defined contracts with our, with our farmers where we define quantity, quality, farming practices. Um, and they always compare what they are growing hemp versus growing an alternate, an alternate crop. So, so, so the, hemp, the hemp prices that we've agreed with with our farmers meet their economic returns. Um, and not only for them is it a good economic return, but as I said, it's a regenerative outcome and a very fast crop. So it actually, it actually gives them uh, an interim crop that they normally wouldn't have. So they get, they actually, uh, it's very positive for them. And then a, a question I know we generally get asked. Um, is there a slide in here on the current shareholder structure management board um yeah so if you go if you go back a couple we can talk to the shareholder structure 
Yeah, here we so go. This one. There it is. So, so about sixty-seven percent of our of our shares are controlled by the top twenty shareholders. It's a very tightly and com tightly held and committed group of shareholders. We are we obviously this is the first opportunity to start sharing um, sharing the the business story in the future with a broader base. So hopefully that will that will evolve and change over time as interest grows. In terms of the management team, there's a, a slide you, you flipped over before, or there's a board structure, um, which talks to, uh, so we've got a small board. Um, and um, so, so uh, one of our directors is, is sitting on this call, uh, listening to me this morning. So, um, so I'm on my very best behavior, but uh, we have a small board, which is Cameron, who's our chairman and Pauline, who's our independent non-executive director. James Hood, who is one of the co-founders of the business. Um, and I'm the chief executive officer. So very small, very small um, team, which reflects the size of the business at this point. So that's one after coming in here now. Um, yeah, is this supply of hemp seeds secured? I think we've kind of maybe covered this and are farmers willing to sign up to grow hemp? I guess that's the, the, uh, the other thing is if, if uh, your business takes off, um, are you worried about supply constraints? I think maybe is a more broader question on that point. So we, we planned, uh, th there's a lot of thinking that goes into the requirements uh, on a season by season basis. Um, we, had, we had a successful harvest last season, both from an output perspective, but a farmer relations, relationship perspective. Um, so we don't really see any shortage of, of product to meet our our forecast requirements for the 2021 season. We're building a seed bank ourselves here from, from the genetic, the unique genetics that we have. So we don't see ongoing supply issues going forward. And we're now into our, we've just completed our fourth harvest. Our fifth harvest, um, we'll start planting in October, November of this year. Um, and uh, we've got more farmers than ever wanting to work with us. So we don't see that as an issue going forward. See another one coming in here now. Sorry, uh, I know Alex telling me I've, I've paraphrased that last question well. And in terms of <laughs> uh, in terms of clients uh, or sorry, climates that uh, you can grow hemp in in Australia, um, are you limited to kind of Tasmania, Victoria, or is this you know that something that can be done over in the wheat belt in in WA? So it's interesting. I know, I know you have uh, another one of the clients that's presented uh, in this forum before who's tried to grow um, hemp in the wheat belt of WA and the soils and the water and the heat don't really support um, hemp, as a, hemp as a crop. Um, we grow it in the latitudes that are similar to the Northern Hemisphere latitudes. So Tasmania, South and Southwestern Victoria. We, we are doing trials in different geographies to see if there are different outcomes in terms of oil content um, and, uh, and, and protein levels in the, um, in the crop in areas such as Mildura on the New South Wales, South Australia, um, Victorian border and, uh, and other parts of Victoria. Um, there are crops that are grown in um, Northern New South Wales. So th there is an ability to grow in other geographies to, and we're looking at that to be able to extend our supply window if we require and to look at the different outcomes that come from the crop. And I'm guessing if it doesn't work in WA, it's not going to work in tropical Queensland either. I would think that's correct. But again, I'm not, I'm not an expert agronomist, so I couldn't give you a definitive answer. Um, I'm not sure if this was disclosed in the announcement, but the Annex Food Supply Agreement uh, was there any kind of revenue numbers disclosed around that for what it means to um, APH, Neil? Yes, yes. So it's a $780,000 um, contract over a two-year period. So $360,000 thereabouts on an annualised basis with defined quantities and offtakes from the client. Okay, so it's a standard take-or-pay contract. Correct. Okay, unless we've got any further questions for Neil. Um, 
we'll leave it there. Neil, if uh, anybody wants to get in touch with you or find out more about um, APH, what's the, the best way to go about it? The best way is by email, um, which is neil, N-E-A-L-E, at ozprimaryhemp.com.au. More than happy to, uh, to, to, to have anyone reach out and, um, and get in contact, and I'll be back in contact with you as soon as possible. Okay, great. Neil, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up uh, uh, event number nine of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. As I said, this recording will be going up on the YouTube channel in the next day or two as soon as I get back from my video editing people. Um, if you want to watch back anything that you've seen here this morning or forwarded on to anyone else who might be interested, um, and with that, I'd like to wish you all uh, a good Thursday and um, keep an eye on the Coffee Microcaps Twitter channel for um, details of our next event. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.